In this video, I'll be showing that the Lebesgue measure of the closed interval is just its length, and then from there I'll prove that the, it's also true for the open interval. So first we start off with a theorem that is called the compactness of the uh, closed interval, and it says that any ik open, so these are open intervals, that covers covers the closed interval a to b okay any of those has a finite subcover okay and i'll denote it i k i okay so now i'm going to use this fact and it's a uh, pretty important and first, and now let's just state our new theorem, is that the Lebesgue measure of the interval a, b is equal to b minus a. And a proof? Okay, what is the proof of this? Well, first, I'm going to prove that the Lebesgue measure from a to b is going to be less than or equal to b minus a. Okay? Now the reason for this is because the interval a minus epsilon, b plus epsilon, um, covers a, b. Okay, so I'm going to have up here my interval a to b. I'm going to have that right there, that open interval, right there is a distance of epsilon, there and there. Okay, so that covers epsilon for epsilon bigger than zero, so that the Lebesgue measure of the interval is less than or equal to the uh, measure of this, which is going to be a minus b plus 2 epsilon. Okay, and this is true for any epsilon, right? Because the Lebesgue measure is the infimum, and so this is an overestimate, and therefore that length, the sum of the lengths of all the intervals, which is just the one interval, it's going to be a minus b plus 2 epsilon. Because this is true for any epsilon, by the epsilon lemma, the Lebesgue measure from of a the closed interval is less than or equal to sorry not a minus b b minus a b minus a is going to be less than or equal to b minus a by epsilon lemma okay next part of it is proving that it's greater than or equal to so what i'm going to do is i'm going to suppose we're given an arbitrary uh suppose given arbitrary covering ik. Then, what are we going to have? There's going to be, then, I construct a cover by the following mechanism. Right? I have my closed interval, and right here, a, a must be contained in one of them. So I say I have the open interval a1, b1. Okay, that contains a. But because b1 is in this interval, assuming, but if it covers the entire thing, we're done. Assuming that it doesn't cover the entire thing and that it's in this area, we construct a b2 right there an a2 to b2 that contains that, right? It's right there. That contains B1. Okay? That's required. And then, B2, assuming that it already hasn't covered it, there must be a A3 to B3 containing it. Right? In IK. These are all elements of I, the covering. And then you continue this, you're like, 
Lucas, how do I know this doesn't continue on forever? It might. But what we do is we make sure that it's finite using this. Because this would cover it. There might be infinite, countably infinite. But what you do is you make sure that it's finite by compactness. And so using this construction, you can see that A1 is less than um, that uh, we need it that a k is less than b k minus 1. Because a3 has to be less than b2 in order to ensure that this interval contains it. And that, that, that must be less than b k. Okay, this is the requirement that we have on this. And so, we know that the sum of the lengths from k equals 1 to uh, infinity of the lengths of these intervals, right, of this covering, is going to be greater than or equal to, because this is a restriction to it, the sum on these from k equals 1 to n, the finite sum, of the lengths of these intervals, or I could just write bk minus ak. And so, this is going to be equal to uh, bn minus an plus b minus uh, all the way down until b1 minus a1. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this so that this is going to be bn minus an minus bn minus 1. I can do that. That would become a positive. It's fine. Minus, you get the idea, right? Minus an minus 1 minus bn minus 2. Continue that pattern down all the way down until I get b2 minus a or uh, a2 minus b1 until a minus a1. Now, an is less than that, so this is going to be negative, right? That right there is going to be negative. Minus negative is positive, 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 positive. If this is going to be bigger than or equal to bn minus a1, right? That's uh, blatantly obvious because we're just adding a bunch of more extra terms. So this is going to be bigger than or equal to bn minus a1. But bn has to be bigger than b in order to contain b. Okay? So that's bigger than b. And a1 has to be less than a in order to contain a. So a1 is less than a. This right here is strictly, is uh, bigger than or equal to b minus a. So I have it that this length is bigger than or equal to b minus a. And so this is for arbitrary amounts. So that means that the infimum being less than this, that's going to be the infimum, which is going to be greater than or equal to the Lebesgue measure itself. And so the Lebesgue measure from A to B is bigger than or equal to B minus A. And that's the proof. Because we have it less than B, less than or equal to, and we have it's bigger than or equal to, therefore it's equal to. Now, this is the Lebesgue outer measure. We have not proven that B, the interval A to B, is in fact measurable, but uh, I will find a proof of that eventually. And this actually proves actually proves that this is also true for the open interval because I have it that the length um, for every for every epsilon bigger than zero, um, the open interval a to B contains the closed interval from A plus epsilon to B minus epsilon. Okay? 
And in other words, um, that for epsilon bigger than zero, there exists closed J, a subset of I, where I is an open interval, such that the length of J is going to be uh, such that the length of J is bigger than the length of I minus epsilon. Okay? Because I could do instead here, I could do A plus uh, epsilon over 2 and B minus epsilon over 2. And that'd be uh, have length bigger than li minus epsilon. And so here I have at the length of i minus epsilon is going to be less than the length of j, which is equal to, like we just proven, the Lebesgue measure of j, which, because j is a subset of i, is going to be less than or equal to the Lebesgue measure of i, right? <laughs> which is going to be less than or equal to the Lebesgue measure of i closure. Now, i closure basically means we take it from a to b in under the closure, i closure. It takes it to the closed interval a to b, which, as we just proven, was equal to the length of i bar, which is b minus a. So that we've proven here that the length of i, which is also equal to the length of i, okay? The length of i minus epsilon is going to be less than or equal to the Lebesgue measure of i, right there, which is going to be less than or equal to the length of i. Therefore, the length of i, this is true for any epsilon, and by the epsilon lemma, okay, by the epsilon lemma, I can add that epsilon over, right, so that this is going to be less than plus epsilon, which is going to be less than this plus epsilon. This is true for any epsilon, therefore, this squeezes it in, right? If this is true for arbitrary epsilon, this squeezes it in, and we get that the length of i is equal to the Lebesgue measure of i. Okay? That just squeezes it in. This is by epsilon lemma, I think, an epsilon lemma corollary. Corollary. And there we go. We've proven that for both the closed and the open intervals, their Lebesgue measures is just their lengths.